الحمد لله وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له. Praise be to God. I bear witness that there is no God except the one God who is doing everything. God is doing everything. And some people added a few things. Lisa, the other day, was telling me she added, and I wholeheartedly submit to him. Next, uh, another complete sentence. God is doing everything, and I wholeheartedly submit to him. Because this ultimate conclusion that God is doing everything sheds a whole new light on the idea of submission to God. Because from now on, you will not be an objector. You will not be unhappy with anything. If you're unhappy with anything, you're an objector. If there is anything that causes unhappiness, you have to find out what it is and eliminate it. Look for the non-Quranic situations in your life. Eliminate them. You must live, you must be sure that everything in your life is Quranic. Quranic means the word of God. In the meeting in San Diego, the one fellow over there, the objecting fellow, was saying that uh, out of this research came the, uh, the dating for the end of the world. In the first book, The Computer Speaks, as you remember, I said that uh, the end of the world, God says that the end of the world is 22 AD. AD. 1710 AH. Both of them multiples of 19. Okay, he said that this is a very dangerous thing to say. Now, why is it dangerous? Whether it is correct or, or wrong, why is it dangerous? First of all, we're not going to live until that time. Second of all, if it is wrong, I mean, what is, I mean, why is it? It's a piece of information. I must mention here that uh, the three minimum requirements in the Quran. In Surah 2, verse 62, and also the same thing is repeated in Surah 5. It says the minimum requirements are believe in God, believe in the hereafter, lead the righteous life. These are the three minimum requirements. You make it to heaven. If you believe in God alone, believe in the hereafter and lead the righteous life. There is nothing about Moses and Jesus and Muhammad. You don't have to believe in them. There's nothing about the Quran or the Bible or the Gospel. You don't have to believe in them. There's nothing in there about anything. There's nothing about the angels. You believe in the angels? Of course you believe in the angels. But it is not a requirement. It's a piece of information. It's an additional piece of information. There's a difference between the knowledgeable person and an ignorant person. And all of them, if they satisfy these three requirements, they make it to heaven. But to believe in the angels, the, the messengers, the scriptures, all these are additional pieces of information, valuable pieces of information. And one of the valuable pieces of information is that God put in the Quran the end of the world. So I'm going, this khutbah will be devoted to this. First of all, the Quran is God's final message to the world. God is the only one who knows when the world will end. And God wants to tell the world about the end of the world and when it will be. And God put it in the, in the final message to the world. So it is not me who is saying or predicting the end of the world. It is the all knowledgeable God Almighty that is saying in the Quran when it will end. And it goes like this, in Surah 20, verse 15, God says, I will not keep the end of the world hidden. And in Surah 15, God says, we have given you, O Muhammad, the seven pairs. The seven pairs. 14. And the letters that I showed you in the first khutbah are 14. 14 sets. So they are, as you see, a fantastic miracle. And uh, God is telling Muhammad what a blessing it was that God gave him these seven pairs. Now, when the Quran was revealed, there were no numbers. 
this ALM, the first verse of Surah 2, for example, you can look on them as letters, and you can also look on them as numbers. This is 71. This was 71 at the time of revelation of the Quran. We did not have these numbers when the Quran was revealed. A is 1, L is 30, M is 40. 1, 30, 40, the total is 71. You add the 14 sets of numbers, and they give you 17 all night total. So we have given you, O oh Muhammad, the verse, when you look at it carefully in view of all the Quran, <coughs> that from Muhammad to the end of the world, or from the Quran to the end of the world, 1709 years. After you complete 1709 years, you go into 1710. After Hijrah, which is a multiple of 19, there is one flag goes up, a sign, a confirmation. The corresponding year, AD, is 2280, which is also a multiple of 19. Another flag goes up. This Discovery happened in the year 1400. A.H. And it said that the end of the world will be 1709. I mean, the, the total number of the letters was 1709. So how many years are left? How many complete years? Because 1710 will not be complete. Before the end of 1710, the world will end. 309. And immediately a flag goes up. We find in Surah 18, the people of the cave. God didn't tell us how many there are in the cave. And, and God goes out of his way to tell us, I'm not going to tell you how many there are in the cave. Three, and people say four. Five, and people say six. Or seven, and people say their eight is a dog. Say, God knows how many there are. So I'm not going to tell you how many, but he tells us how long they lasted in the cave. 300 increased by 9. Why? This is a Quranic number. And, uh, and uh, you, you look in the surah, and it tells you why God says, told us about the field of the cave. It says, to remove all doubt about the end of the world. I'm going to say it in Arabic, and the translation in English. I mean, what is more straightforward than that? It says, That the end of the world, there is no doubt about it. Now, so this, to remove all doubt concerning the calculations, this is connected with the end of the world. We have given you the seven pairs. It's connected with the end of the world in Surah 15. The verse before that, before we have given you seven pairs, God says that God is the omniscient, who knows, the creator of the omniscient, who knows everything and knows when the world will end. That your Lord is the creator of the omniscient, who knows when it will end. We have given you seven pairs and the great Quran. So all these signs together tell us that there is no doubt, but it is a piece of information, it is not required to go to heaven. The minimum requirements are believe in God, believe in the hereafter, lead a righteous life under any name. If you're a Buddhist or Hindu or Christian or Jewish or Muslim, under any name, if you worship God alone, the creator of the universe, and believe in the hereafter, heaven and hell, resurrection after death, and lead a righteous life. You can't just believe in God and the hereafter and be a nasty, bad person. Liar, cheat, and all that. You have to lead a righteous life. So these three minimum requirements will lead you to heaven. Belief in the messengers, Muhammad, Jesus, Moses, is not required. The angels is not required. Believing in the scriptures is not required. We don't see it in the... Believing that the, the world will end in 1710 or 2280 it is, not, is not required. But it is a valuable piece of information, as valuable as knowing that there are angels and jinns and messengers and scriptures. Atim al
الحمد لله وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له. Praise be to God. We bear witness that there is no God except the one God. We are a very fortunate generation, and this is understatement of the year. In Surah 32, God says that uh, certain people have no idea how much uh, joy and happiness await them. And uh, we have no idea how fortunate we are, but uh, 50 years from now, the future generations will realize how fortunate we are. We are the pioneers of something that is very special. About 50 years ago, for example, God's miracles through his messengers existed without any proof. And uh, even now, our generation, excluding the pioneers that we have become, you go to them and say, Moses threw down the staff and it became a snake. And they say, sure, oh yeah, sure. The unbelievers, even the believers have doubts. You tell them, Jesus revived the dead. And say, oh, maybe he just fainted or something, or he was just, you know, he was sick or something and he came back to life. They do not believe those miracles. But now, God gives us the first tangible evidence that when Moses threw down the staff, it became a snake. Because what we have, and turns out that this has been always the case in the scriptures, in the, in the Bible, in the Old Testament, the New Testament, everything that God sent down, everything that God created, you and me and the sun, the moon, the stars, they all have God's signature on them. The scriptures are mathematically composed, numerically structured, beyond human intelligence, so every statement in the Quran becomes proven with physical evidence. So when the Quran makes a statement, Moses threw down the staff and became a snake. This becomes a physical, a physical evidence, proving it. Because it is mathematically composed by God himself. It is authenticated by the mathematical composition that comes only from God, not from a human being. And God was an eyewitness there. God was an eyewitness who saw Moses throw down the staff and it became a snake. And he's telling us, in, in a numerically structured statement. And the same is true with Jesus revived the dead. Every statement in the Quran is physically proven beyond doubt. So that's how, this is the fortune that we are not aware of. And this is how fortunate we are, is that we have now, you read the Quran and you have full confidence in everything it says, including many things that are unbelievable like Moses throwing down the staff and having it turn into a snake. God says in the Quran in, in uh, Surah 41 verse 53, I will increase my, my evidence. I will continuously increase my evidence until everyone believes that this is the truth. So when I'm going to talk to you today about the miracle of Quran again because there's some new evidence that just came out confirming this statement of God that he will increase his evidence. So initially, we said that uh, the first verse of Quran consisted of 19 letters. And the number of surahs, 114, is a multiple of 19. And they said, uh, well, this is coincidence. This one, this came out first. And then we found out that uh, in Surah in Tal Cube, there are 57 cubes. The, other, the only other Surah initialed with Q also had 57 cubes. 19 times 3, and 19 times 3, 19 letters in the first verse, 19 times 6, the Quran Surahs. And, uh, and people said, coincidence. Then we found out that if you add these two, 57, 57, you have 114. Q stands for Quran, 114 surahs, and they said this is coincidence. They still they continued to disbelieve. And then we said that uh, this statement here, which is 19 letters, 
every word of it is found in the Quran in multiples of 19. The first word is 19 times, the second word 2698 times, the third word 57 times, the fourth word 114 times. And they said this is coincidence. So God kept increasing the evidence. And you know the rest. You know that the letter Noon in Surah Noon is 133, multiple of 19. You know that uh, we have, I'm just remind you of a few of those, so you will be the people who appreciate the Masjid Tucson miracle more than anybody else. There are seven surahs initial to Hamim, HM. Seven chapters constituting about one tenth of the Quran. And you count these letters in the seven chapters, and you have 2,147 of these letters in the seven chapters. This is 19 times 113. If only one H, one H, or one M was lost or added or substituted in the last 1,400 years, this will increase by one or decrease by one, and the whole thing disappears. The whole thing collapses. So you can see the mathematical composition that is beyond the human intelligence and uh, has to be from God. The thing that gives you confidence that when Moses threw down the staff it became a snake, it's like you're, a, you're an eyewitness. You're just as good as an eyewitness, if not better. When Moses threw down the staff and became a snake, how many people saw that? Very few people who were inside the palace hall with Pharaoh. And how long did it last? A few minutes. And that was it. That was the end of it. The miracle happened. A few people saw it. It was over in a few minutes. But this miracle of Quran is continuous. Forever. It is, a, it is perpetual. It, it is doing two things. It is a continuous miracle until the end of the world. And it confirms all those temporary miracles that were limited by time and space, like Jesus reviving the dead. How long did it take for Jesus to revive Lazarus? How many people saw Jesus revive Lazarus? But now we know, now we are witnessing that miracle now. Millions of people, by mathematically composed statements, authenticated by God himself. We know that this is not man-made. God wrote that, and who was an eyewitness? So when this came out, they said, we don't believe it. I just re received a review written by some something something Philip. Philip is the last name. It's not our Philip here. Some other Philip. And they finally admitted that there are four or five surahs that uh, are actually have multiples of 19. So what they admitted was the Q's but these are 57 in each of the Q initial surahs. So that's two surahs. The end in surah 68, uh, they said, that, yes, this is correct. The Yasin, YS, initial surah, uh, surah 19, KHYAS, five initials. What was the other surah? I think this is it. And they said this is not enough to establish a pattern. It is pure coincidence. Okay, so they don't, they don't, be, but at least finally they admitted that there is something here. About the HM surahs, they said, uh, why is he adding them together? And, and uh, they raised all kinds of strange questions. So, what, we, what you'll see in the next issue, the Muslim perspective, not this one, not October, but November is that it is obvious that God is increasing his evidence just as he said in chapter 41 and that those people will continue to say no we don't believe in order to expose and confirm the hardcore unbelievers who will end up in the lowest pit of hell the reason <laughs> the reason I'm saying this is that uh, Lisa yesterday found something else I'm, I'm, this photo should be given by Lisa by the way but uh, this fits in the mainstream of, of the... Uh, this is really profound, as you would agree. 
And if you want more details, you can ask her afterwards. There is something in the, uh, in the Muslim perspective of last month where, uh, let me get one of those Qurans to explain to you what the deal is. The preliminary information that you have is that 114 surahs in the Quran, 29 of them are initialed with the Quranic initials A, L, M, Q, N, S, K, H, Y, and so on. This initial, 29 of them. The first initial, as you know, is in, the, in surah number 2, verse number 1, that says A, L, M. The first one is in Surah number 2, verse 1. And the last one is the initial N in Surah 68. Here it is. So, this part here of the, of the book is what is between the first initial and the last initial. And uh, what Lisa found in the last issue, the Muslim perspective as, as published in that issue, was that between these two, the number of verses is a multiple of 19. Five thousand two hundred sixty-three between the first initial and the last initial. It's a multiple of 19. 19 times 2, 7, 7. Excluding the two false verses. Of, at the end of surah number 9. Also between these, the first initial and the last initial, there are 19 groups of initial and uninitial surahs. In other words, surah 2 and 3 are initial, that's one group. Surahs 4, 5 and 6 are not initial, that's group number 2. You go on like this, it's 19 groups. So uh, what, what does this say? This piece of information says that the number of verses is a divine order dictated by God because it conforms to the, to the mathematical code. Also the sequence of surahs, because the initial, uninitial, and so on, they alternate, they make up 19 groups. Now last night what she found was really profound and has to do with, uh, with this with this part here. Okay, now in the, in the whole Quran, the word Allah is a multiple of 19. Allah is mentioned 2698 times. And God cho chose to put the first initial in Surah 2, the last initial in, uh, in Surah 68. So what she did is uh, add up the number, the word Allah that happened here, easier. She, she added the word Allah here in the smaller part. Surah Al-Fatiha, before the ALM, and from 69, Surah 68, I'm smiling for a reason. Surah 68 has the letter N at the beginning. So counting the word Allah outside this, it came to 57. Allah, the word Allah outside. in this portion here, and in Surah Al-Fatiha. There are two of them in Surah Al-Fatiha. Now, when she counted these verses, you count from ALM, that's verse 1 of Surah 2, to the letter N, that's verse 1 of Surah 68, and you stop, because there are no initials after N. So the rest of Surah N is not counted in that, because it's, it's inclusive. Now, when you count the word Allah, in between here, the difference is 2641. You deduct this from the total number of Allah, which is also a multiple of 19, of course. But uh, God knows that the people who look at this, what, what, what does this tell us? This tells us that the number of the verse is dictated by God. The number of the verse. And if you look at Yusuf Ali, you see that he changed the numbers because it sounded better to him. You know, because the numbering of the verses is strange in some places and he couldn't take it. So he played around with it. Now we wouldn't dare do that. 
And in spite of the things that happened in the last 1400 years, the Quran comes to us unscathed, with the numbers of the verses exactly right. I'm talking about the numbers of the verses and the numbers of the surahs, as you will see before the end of this khutbah. Okay, I was saying that when you count the verses, you include, you start with the ALM and you end up with the N. So you have all of Surah 68 not counted in this because it is outside that range, verse-wise. So God knew that the unbelievers would say, why don't you count the word Allah in Surah 68? also and we did or she did and it is zero in surah 68 there's not a single word allah so well anyway anyway they want to protest god got their number zero <laughs> the number is zero so i mean it's really strange that a surah as as big as surah 68 does not have any words allah in it and I will complete the, uh, this khutbah in the next section, inshallah. Tubu Allah, repent. Alhamdulillah, wa ashadu an la ilaha illallah, wa ahdahu la sharika lah. This is only a small part of the, uh, the great miracle that was discovered yesterday. And I have been calling around the world this morning to spread the news out of here. Because uh, some people started the rumor that only the initial chapters are guarded. But this shows that all the Quran is guarded. Because the word Allah is all over the place, as you know, thousands of them. And this portion here is outside the, the initial area, if you want to call it that. And within the initial area, we have the 19 groups. Everything is so perfectly uh, tight that uh, there is no hole for the disbelievers to escape. And it is amazing that they continue to say, no, they, they continue to fail to see the miracle. Because God himself said in chapter 7, I will divert away from my miracles those who are too arrogant. And no matter what kind of miracle you show them, they will not see it. God said that. So this is the explanation. Now listen to this. These 57 words, Allah, that are outside the initial, that are here, they happen in, in, in surahs and verses, certain surahs and certain verses. And when you add the numbers of the surahs and the verses where this happen, the total is 2432, 2432. And this is 19 times 1, 2, 8. Right. Now this is a big number. You add the numbers of the surahs and, and the verses where the word Allah occurs. And you're going to read this in the next issue of the perspective. Now what does this tell us? This tells us the sequence of the surahs is dictated by God. The number of the surahs, the number of the verses where the word Allah takes place. Where the word Allah occurs. And it is so magnificent because there are verses where more than one Allah, you find one or two or three. Allah is in one verse. But you cannot count the verse twice. So this system is so perfect. You have no doubt that you are reading the words of God right here. And when God says, I put guards on you, you know that there are guards on you. So you will not receive a scratch without God's control, without deserving it or without a good reason for it. Because sometimes God will mess up your life in order to, to have something good happen to you. Joseph had to go to prison in order to rule Egypt afterwards. He had to. So going to prison was equivalent to going to school and graduating with a degree. He graduated from the prison to rule Egypt. 
So even though the prison looked terrible, like a disaster, it was to promote Joseph to a good position. So when God says, I put guards on you, when God speaks throughout the Quran about invisible soldiers, you know that he runs this world with invisible soldiers. When God says that everything is written down before the earth was created, everything is already recorded. What you're going to do next year is already recorded. How many kids you're going to have is already recorded. Who they are going to marry is already written down. What day and time and hour and place you're going to die is written down. Everything is written down, recorded. God says that. And God says, I'm, I'm telling you this so you don't feel sorry for the things you miss and you don't get excited over the, the things you attain. You have, a, the believer has an even keel. He or she doesn't get excited or depressed. Because everything is already recorded, there's nothing anybody can do. But he guarantees victory for his people. I mean to the point, I'm going to read for you Psalm 91 again. Which I read for you before. And, and these were mathematically authenticated too. David's Psalms. Now we have evidence that the whole scripture, we're talking about the original scripture, was mathematically, mathematically authenticated. This psalm happens to be confirmed in the Quran. When God says, I'll make you a king or queen on earth, you know that this is from God and you know that it is the absolute truth. When God tells you, I'm doing everything, you know this is the absolute truth. And, and uh, when, when you pass the initial tests, and you worship God regularly and you do the five prayers, certainty will come to you. I'm smiling because this is something that we live every day. We lived it today. God was showing us that we are not doing anything. Even the words we utter. God is doing everything. And when he says this, you know that it is the absolute truth. Here is Psalm 91. Very quickly. You who dwell in the shelter of the Most High. This means every believer is talking to you who abide in the shadow of the Almighty. You've decided to join God. You abide in the shadow of the Almighty. Say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress. This is what you say. You decide to, say, to tell God, my Lord, you're my refuge, you're my fortress. For he will rescue you from the snare of the fowler, from the destroying pestilence. With his pinions he will cover you. Under his wings he shall take, uh, you shall take refuge. His faithfulness is a buckler and a shield. One of God's name in the Quran is the faithful. When you tell God, I'm going to join you, I'm, I'm going to be with you, I'm going to believe your word, God is faithful to you, and he will fulfill his part of the promise. You happen to have no power, and he has all power. You can do nothing for God, but he can do everything for you. Okay, David goes on and says, with God's inspiration, you shall not fear the terror of the night and the arrow that flies by day. You shall not fear the pestilence that roams in darkness, nor the devastating plague at noon. Though a thousand fall at your side because of the AIDS disease. No, that's from me. <laughs> Though, I mean, it will not touch you. Though a thousand fall at your side, ten thousand at your right side, near you it shall not come. This is what God is saying. These are God's words that he reveals through David. The Psalms were written by God through David's mouth to teach us. And you know every word in it is true. It is confirmed by the Quran and by this fantastic mathematical code whose parameters are increasing and the evidence is piling up beyond belief. Rather, with your eyes shall you behold and see the requital of the wicked. As a person of God, you're going to see that the people who are unjust to you, they're going to get it sooner or later. And the Quran repeats that even if you don't see it, they will get it. God will let you know. You know, they may persecute you until the last week of your life and you may not see it. This is what the Quran says, whether you see it or not, you will get it. But if you're alive, you will see it. God will let you know. 
Because you have the Lord for your refuge, you have made the most high your stronghold. When God controls Ronald Reagan, your boss, the president of your company is God, really. And he runs it. When the president of the company gives you a raise, God is really the one who is really, I mean, God manipulates the president of your company. When the president of your company reprimands you, God is really doing that. He controls this man's or this woman's heart and mind. So because you have the Lord for your refuge, you have made the Most High your stronghold. No evil shall befall you, nor shall affliction come near your tent. You know that these words are, are God's words that are proven mathematically. You have confidence. Like this, Moses throwing down the staff and became a snake. Now you have confidence that this is the truth. Now you have tangible, physical proof that this is true. And you, have, you better believe it. Now listen, this is how the mechanism is. Listen to this. For to his angels he has given command about you that they guard you in all your ways. Upon their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. They're going to carry you up like this on their hands if you're going to dash your foot against the stone. You better believe that. God is saying it. It is proven mathematically. Lest you dash your foot against a stone. You're walking in the night, and there's a stone, you're going to hit it, you don't see it, and the angels will, will carry you, or will remove the stone. That's what God does. Everything in this world is done by angels. I mean by God, but I mean through His angels. Atum <laughs> salah And we bear witness that there is no God except the one true God. It all began a few billion years ago when an angel named Satan entertained supercilious thoughts that he can be a God besides God. And God decided that one way of letting Satan find out is to call his bluff and make him a God. Now a God cannot be a God without two things, a dominion and constituents. And to provide Satan with a dominion, God created a billion galaxies containing a billion trillion stars contained in a universe that is 26 billion light years across. And to emphasize the insignificance, the insignificance of Satan's dominion to be, which is the planet Earth, God created six other universes, even bigger than this one. And then eventually God told Satan that this little moat in the smallest and innermost universe called planet Earth will be your dominion. God equipped the planet Earth with the means to support life for plants, animals, and humans. No other place in the universe is so equipped. And to provide Satan with constituents, God created a minute, a minute creature from clay, a lowly material, named him Adam, and then God ordered the angels to fall prostrate before Adam. They all did except for the haughty one. He refused. Now this is God's mercy. Had God punished Satan for his supercilious thoughts, 
without exposing them, the angels would have been really perplexed. Why? What did God do this for? Satan didn't do anything. Because the angels are not aware of Satan's innermost thoughts, like God is. So God exposed Satan as a haughty rebel, and then told him that he will have this dominion and, and these constituents, the descendants of this creature, Adam, who happen to agree with Satan's point of view, namely that God alone is not enough. We have two points of view. God's point of view that God alone is the absolute Lord and Master, no one else. And then we have the other point of view that God alone is not enough, that we can have some other lords and masters besides God. So all the human beings, the descendants of Adam, who agree with Satan's point of view, were destined to be Satan's constituents. Satan's constituents were not assigned to him involuntarily. God consulted each one of us. He asked us, do you want to take a test where you choose between my point of view and another point of view? Do you want to take a test where you choose between me as your only Lord and Master or to have another Lord and Master besides me? Every constituent of Satan was consulted. Every single human being was consulted and we said yes. The human being said yes. Other creatures said no. They were afraid. We, the, there must have been incentives that made us agree to take the test. One incentive is the fantastic, the awesome reward for those who make it, those who pass the test. That is a positive incentive. The other reason probably was that we overestimated our intelligence. We said, of course we're going to choose you. You know, it's going to be stupid if we choose anybody else. We're going to take the test. You and I said that. So Satan's constituents were assigned to him after they, they chose with their free will to take the test and after they decided to side with Satan's point of view. Now, once this was uh, agreed on, the agreement stipulated that every human being will be born into this world with instinctive, God-given knowledge about God. In addition to this, God will send messages and messengers to continuously remind the human being to worship God alone. The other side, Satan is given, is allowed to reproduce every time a human being is born, every time a baby is born, Satan is allowed to reproduce. Another baby of Satan is also born at the same time. And will attach, this piece of Satan will attach itself to the human being from birth to death. And will continuously talk Satan's point of view to you and me, to the human being, saying God alone is not enough. You have to have Muhammad or Jesus or Mary or this saint also. They can help you too. God alone is not enough. And you with your instinctive knowledge and with the messages that you receive are supposed to talk Satan's ambassador, representative, who is your, you, who, he has your name. You're supposed to talk, talk Satan's representative into worshiping God alone, that Satan is wrong. This companion is a descendant of Satan and he can go anyway, either way, he or she. Same with you. So this is the agreement and this is the test that is happening right now. 
Immediately, Satan went to work on Adam and Eve. They were living in paradise during their innocence. And you and I and all of us, we were in Adam and Eve. And Satan fooled us and made us break God's law. When I wrote a script for a movie, I showed this universal conference of all the human beings who were destined to come on this planet Earth, bearing witness that God alone will be our Lord and Master. And then I showed all these souls, all the human beings, combining together. Symbolically, I made it look like a DNA molecule all the souls combined together in DNA molecule and then this one united soul was thrust into Adam's clay body. So we were all, this is my understanding, my comprehension of it, we were all in Adam. And we all broke God's law, this is why we are here. And this is exactly how the plan was to work. So eventually Satan fooled Adam, tricked him, made him break God's law, and then Adam, Eve, Satan, and, and all those who agreed with Satan, there seems to be a number of other angels maybe who also fell with Satan, became jinns. The definition of a jinn is a fallen angel. Your companion is a jinn, a descendant of Satan, the father of all the jinns, or the first jinn. Adam, Eve, Satan, and anyone who agreed with Satan's point or, or who broke God's law or agreed with Satan's point of view were sent to prison. And their prison is this universe, our universe. 26 billion light years across. This is Satan, Satan's prison cell. And it's too small for him. He can't go, he and his descendants cannot go beyond the smallest and innermost universe. This is his prison cell. And we read in the Quran that they continuously try to break, escape, break out of it, and go listen to the secrets in the other universes. And they can't, because this is a, this is a well-guarded universe, our universe. Our universe again has a billion galaxies and our neighbor galaxy next door is two million light years away so this shows you the insignificance of Satan's dominion the earth and everything on it if it disappeared right now nothing will happen to God's domain nothing you go to the edge of our galaxy the Milky Way you will not even see the solar system let alone the planet Earth. You cannot see the solar system, which is four million miles across. You cannot see it from the edge of our universe. Now, what I want to share with you, this is an introduction only for the second khutbah. I want to share with you a personal experience that teaches all of us the limitations of Satan. And the whole idea of creating these seven universes and the whole human race. Tubu ila Allah. Repent. Alhamdulillah, we praise God. Wa ashadu an la ilaha illa Allah wahdahu la sharika lah. And we bear witness that there is only one God. We worship only one God. We side with God's point of view. That God alone is our Lord and Master. That there is no other creature, no saint, no prophet, nobody can help us or harm us, dead or alive. Only God is our Master. And only God hires and fires and gives health and, and happiness. Only God. <clears throat> what I want to share with you is a conclusion That is, that is very solid in my mind and in the minds of most of you, 
that Satan decided, since he is to whisper to us and talk us into accepting his point of view, this is the agreement. That he, instead of wasting his time with the followers, he will capture the leaders, the Pope. Okay. 900 million Catholics listen to the Pope. So why should he waste his time with 900 million people when he can just capture one? In, in Muslim countries, religious schools, Al-Azhar in Egypt, for example, Children start going from, from first grade, and Azar has from first grade to the PhD level. And certain children will start an Azar from the first grade. And Satan knows that these children will grow up to be quote unquote religious scholars who will lead the people and will teach them the religion. The Imams. That I'm talking about the Imams of jurisprudence, Shafi'i and Malik and Ibn Hanbal and those. Millions of people follow them, followed them. So why should he waste his time with individuals when he can catch the leader and mislead the millions by misleading one leader? So this is his method. So this this has been his tactic ever since the, he came down to this earth was to look for the leaders and catch them, possess them. And it's very easy in the, in the Muslim countries, there is the Islamic University in Medina. And everybody who's going there is going to teach other people. What's so always going to take these people? He and his assistants, or just him by himself, he possess all those kids, all the students. So they graduate into his lab and they do his orders, they carry out his commands. Now my personal experience, <coughs> the miracle of the Quran has grown to overwhelming proportions, it is going to overwhelm the world. And I'm going, let me interrupt here and give you the latest development. This was discovered yesterday or the day before yesterday. And it's very quick, but it shows you how the miracle is growing to undeniable proportions. It's going to overwhelm even the enemies of the Quran. What was discovered yesterday or the day before yesterday was that the Quran contains numbers. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, up to 12, and then 19, and then 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, and then after 80 comes 99, and then 100, 200, 300, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 5,000, 50,000, 100,000. These are all the numbers in the Quran, without repetitions, of course, as you know. When you add these numbers, the total is 1, 6, 2, 1, 3, 4. I may be mistaken. I think it is 1, 6, 1, 6, 2, 1, 3, 4. Maybe not, but uh, after the khutbah, I can give you the correct number. The total is fixed. It doesn't matter if I make mistakes or not. It is fixed. It is in the Quran. It is a multiple of 19. It is 19 times 8, 5, 3, 4. This is the latest discovery. And uh, let me add uh, one more minute of elaboration on why this is miraculous. For example, the number 50, there's only one number 50 in the Quran. And it is written like this, Noah lived with his people 1,000 years less 50. So it was not written 950. Another place says, uh, we summoned Moses for 30 nights and increased them by 10. So you can see how the numbers being independent and how they add up to a divisible total. Uh, if you do not make a sacrifice under certain conditions during Hajj, sacrifice of an animal, you're supposed to fast three days during Hajj and seven days when you go home, which adds up to 10, because the Quran says that. Of course, we know three and seven is 10, but that's essential to have the number 10. So you can. You can see how the mathematical composition of Quran and how miraculous it is beyond human capability. So this miracle is growing to overwhelming proportions. And Satan knew about it. And I assure you, he did 
everything possible in his capacity to stop it from coming out. Because now the cat is out of the bag, like they say. He can do nothing now. It's too late. I believe he even started a whole new religion based on the number 19 just to divert. Because this did divert some people from the number 19, some Muslims, so-called Muslims. So he did the impossible. So how did God hide it? This miracle, to surprise Satan. If Satan catches the people going to an other school or the religious school and possesses them, why can't he possess the person who is working on the miracle of Quran? Now here's what happened. <laughs> at the time, at the time I uh, I started computers for the first time, I was working for Monsanto Company. I was a senior research chemist with Monsanto Company. And they decided to computerize their chemical research. So they gave us a crash course in computers, six months. And they told us to practice anything, do anything with the computer, just to practice. <laughs> and this happened to coincide, coincidence, quote unquote, with my desire to know what ALM is and these letters in the Quran. So I said, okay, let me write the whole Quran in the computer and see if these letters have any mathematical relations. So I did, I wrote the whole Quran, I got all the results, all the counts, the raw data. I have the raw data with me. And there was an American Chemical Society meeting in Chicago. That was in August 1970. August 1970. I don't usually remember the dates, but God made me remember some crucial dates because that's... So, at this meeting, this man comes to me and he says, uh, we want you to work for us. Uh, who are you? I'm Robert Seeley, I'm director of research for Anheuser-Busch. I said, forget it. <laughs> I didn't say that twice, I said, sorry, thanks, but no thanks. He said, uh, we'll give you twice as much money. I said, sorry, it's not a matter of money, it's just... Uh, in my religion, we're against alcohol, and it will be hypocritical of me to to work in, in the biggest brewery in the world <laughs> when, when my religion prohibits it. And I happen to be strongly religious. He said, uh, well, I assure you, this has nothing to do with alcohol. I mean, rest assured, this will give you twice as much money, and you will have nothing to do with alcohol. I said, uh, what, what is it? In fact, I said, no thanks, still, you know, I just don't want to be connected with the name Anheuser-Busch. The biggest brewery in the world. It's in St. Louis, it's a fact. <laughs> so, he explained to me, he said, this is in the food research department. And it has nothing, absolutely nothing, has to do with eggs, vitamins, carbohydrates, processed foods, it has nothing to do with alcohol at all. I said, thanks, but no thanks. He said, you know, here is a report from the United Nations that the people in your country, in Egypt, your, your home country, I was not even a citizen then, are going to starve in about 10 years. Don't you want to save them? <laughs> well, he's trying this angle. Good old Bob Seeley, okay? <laughs> I said, so exactly what is the nature of my job there? He said, okay, we throw away this amount of waste, this amount of oats, this amount of barley, this and that, and we want to save it from waste, we want to transform it to food. They have baker's yeast, and they have brewer's yeast, and they can choose to work with either one. They throw tons of yeast. Yeast is rich in protein. And this is my specialty as a biochemist. Anyway, to, ma to make a long story short, I accepted the job with Anheuser-Busch. I took my raw data. I left Monsanto Company August 31st, 1969. We have a witness here, Douglas. And I started with Anheuser-Busch on September 1st, 1970. Took my, all my, my uh, raw data with me and for the next four years, the miracle of the Quran, 
was produced in the biggest brewery <laughs> in the whole world. <laughs> and this is how what I'm trying to share with you is Satan's limitations. And some of you may have been play, playing a game as children where you hide something and go and find it. And the best place to hide it, if I am the person to look for it, is in my pocket, right? If you can slip it in my pocket, I can't find it. I will look around everywhere else. But this is, this is one of the things that many children used to do. They'll, they'll hide the object in the pocket of the person who's looking for it. So imagine Satan looking at the planet Earth and he says, this is an azhar, oh, these people are going to grow up and lead millions to teach about Islam and the Quran and so on, let me get them. And you will look and see, Anhas the biggest brewery in the world. Nah, this is not mine. <laughs> this is my pocket, you forget it. But inside that biggest brewery was the, the miracle of Quran came out. What does this tell us? It tells us that Satan it has limitations where he cannot, he does not know everything that's happening on the planet Earth. God knows what the heart of an ant out there is doing. Every, every atom in the universe, this is a quotation from the Quran, not a single atom is out of God's vision or control. But you can see Satan unable to detect a significant event like this. It was hidden, hidden from him, so he couldn't put up any obstacles against me. And this is what I want to share with you. Akhim as No. Possessor of all possessions, 
possess, possessor of all things. A repeated statement in the Quran is Lillahi ma fi sanawati wa ard. To God belongs everything in the heavens and the earth. God is Malik al Mulk, the, the owner of all kingship. Nobody owns anything in the heavens or the earth. So any intelligent creature will associate himself with the one who possesses everything. He's the one who possesses all the provisions. He's the one who controls your health, your wealth, your happiness. And this is stated very clearly in Surah 54. He is the one who makes you rich or poor. He is the one who decides whether you are happy or miserable. He is the one who makes you happy or miserable. With the understanding that God does not make us miserable, but God's law dictates that we can make ourselves miserable according to God's law. But nobody can make you happy or miserable. Only God. And this is precisely why God says, only those who possess intelligence will come to me. So God says, say, Allah America Mulk, our God, possessor of all possessions, the owner of everything in the heavens and the earth. You give possessions to whomever you will. You give kinship to whomever you will. You remove possessions or you remove kinship from whomever you will. Or remove power from whomever you will. You give dignity to whomever you will. God is the only source of dignity and respect. And you humiliate or to, you, remove, you remove dignity from whomever you will. Biyadikal khayr, in your hand is all provisions, all good things. God is teaching us to say this about God. Innaka ala kulli shayin qadir, you are omnipotent. So God is teaching us that in very simple terms, that are repeated throughout the Quran, that He's the only one who possesses all power. So what, what, what are we doing depending on everybody else? You are the people who decided that God is Malik al Mulk. And uh, as I will introduce you to each other, you're going to see that in each one of you, in the life of each one of you, there are, because you have been put to the test, and you are being put to the test, in the life of each one of you, there are demonstrations and proof that you know that only God possesses all power. <coughs> You come across the people who uh, will try to divert you. Say that you are the number one target of Satan. And this is in accordance with, with God's law. People will try to divert you and will use all kinds of tricks. And Satan will will always work on you. He is not interested in those people out there or idol worshippers or disbelievers. And uh, one of the tricks they will use am I pointing at it? Yeah. It just doesn't distract us. Uh, verse number 2 of Surah 29 says, Do the people think they will be left to say we believe without being put to the test? We have tested those before them, for God will surely distinguish those who are truthful from the liars. So this is why you have to be tested. And we, uh, we never cease to be amazed at uh, how efficient the test is. Recently, at the Mosque of Tucson, we, we had a number of people whom I 
I just fell in love with the wonderful people. And I always wonder, are they strong believers? Will they make it? We will always pray for the people to make it, to pass the test. And we're pulling for them. At the same time, we're also interested in, in having God's test take place in order to sift away those who do not belong among us. It is not something bad, it's been happening all the time that this sifting uh, process because only the, the, the pure diamonds remain. Everything else, the foam flows to the top and is removed. Uh, these very uh, seemingly very strong people uh, were subjected to tests recently. They, they, uh, they were told uh, uh, Rashad is bad, Rashad is manipulating you. And this is by people who are sipping whiskey, as they say that. Don't listen to Rashad. Uh, it's surprising how the, uh, the people were influenced. I, mean, uh, I tell them, worship God alone, follow the word of God alone. And then somebody is sipping whiskey and telling them Rashad is bad. They say, oh, you're right, Rashad is bad. Bye. You know, they they plunk the test so easy. This happens. Satan will work on your ego. I will say, you, you're following Rashad Khalif. And you know better, and I know better. We do not follow Rashad Khalif. We do not follow Muhammad or Jesus. We do not follow any human being. We follow God. We know that. That's why we smile when they say that. But this is just about one of the last straws. Uh, you follow Rashad Khalif is the polite way. But usually say, you follow the crazy Rashad Khalif. You have to add some adjectives, this is to work even harder on our egos. But we make it very clear, we follow Malik al mulk the possessor of all things. We follow only God, we follow only the word of God. And uh, as you know, I'm the first one to tell you, if it is, if it is my opinion, <coughs> if it is Rashad Khalifa, don't follow him. Because you'll probably do the wrong thing. If it is, you must, you must be sure you're following God and following the Word of God. And we will go to any extent to make sure that we are following God and the Word of God. We're not following the words of any human being. Two will not have We praise God and we bear witness that there is no God except the one God. At this rate, it seems like I will finish the Friday sermon and finish the Friday prayer before Ismail Barakat is here. Because at 2 o'clock, we have the introductions and the welcome. God says, only the intelligent come to me. And when we look at the Quran, almost every page says, the only unforgivable offense, if maintained until death, is idol worship. There's only one forgiv unforgivable offense at the time of death. When a person dies and he has committed murders and lies and cheats and theft and adultery and aggression, all these are forgivable. God gave, gave us examples in the Quran. Moses killed somebody, one of God's great prophets. There's only one unforgivable offense at the time of death, and that is idol worship, idolatry. Any person with, with the smallest amount of intelligence will say to himself or herself, if this is the only unforgivable offense, I'm going to avoid any suspicion of it for the rest of my life, all my life. Any hint of idol worship, I'm going to get rid of it. We look at the Quran and it says in Surah 3 verse 18, 
of God, and God begins with Himself. Shahid Allah, God bears witness. And now, La ilaha illahu, that uh, La ilaha illallah. This is the shahada according to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. According to God, the shahada is La ilaha illallah. Well, Malaikatu and the angels, God bless the angels after Him. Wa'ul al ilm, and also possess knowledge. So there is the shahada in plain language, in any language, in any translation. God bears witness that the shahada is La ilaha illallah. And so do the angels and also possess knowledge. Therefore, if I say La ilaha illallah, I am right. So they tell you, okay, put next to it Muhammad Rasulullah. Where, where does this come from? Maybe it is perfectly all right. Maybe. But maybe it's a maybe. Maybe it's idol worship. Maybe it's perfect. But we're not sure. And any intelligent person who knows that the only unforgivable offense is idol worship will say, since La ilaha illallah is correct, and La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah is maybe, I'm going to stick with La ilaha illallah. After all, these are the words that came out of Muhammad's mouth. He will certainly he will not blame me for saying La ilaha illallah on the day of Zatim. I'm talking about God will not blame me. And this is consistent through, through the Quran. In Surah Muhammad, Surah entitled Muhammad number 47, verse 19, says, فَعْلَمْ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهُ You shall know that, لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهُ The Muhammad has took it and they put, فَعْلَمْ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهُ Muhammad Rasulullah. They added it, and you'll see it here in this, in the appendix. Is it? Uh, no, that la ilaha illallah, there's no God except Allah, and Muhammad is Rasulullah, so his messenger. They added it. And they put it in the calligraphy that looks like the Quran to the point that people who memorized the Quran were fooled. They thought it was Quran. Because this kind of idolatry became so common that it became part and parcel of the people's uh, beliefs. God says in the Surah entitled Muhammad Fa'alam and now La ilaha illallah. So why are they trying to push their idolatry on us? It doesn't make sense. Any intelligent person knowing that idol worship is the only unforgivable, unforgivable of will will uh, will run away from any suspicion of idolatry. So then they turn against the only one they say, why don't you believe that Muhammad is Rasulullah? Well, the fact that you uphold the Qur'an is the biggest proclamation that we know that Muhammad is Rasulullah. It's God's message. And we, we have examples that uh, utterly destroy their arguments. The Qur'an is the word of God. And, and consistently, God puts his scriptures ahead of the messengers, the prophets, the Qur'an. God is the believers and those who believe in, in, in God, in Allah, wa malaikatihi, wa kutubihi, wa rusulihi. God, His angels, His scriptures, and His messengers. The scriptures, the word of God comes ahead of the messengers, always in the Quran, in the sequel. So you can ask them, don't you believe, do you believe that the Quran is the word of God? You say yes. Tell them, okay, then you should say, la ilaha illallah, the Quran, kalam Allah. Why don't you say, don't you believe the Quran is kalam Allah, the word of God? What to say, La ilaha illallah? The Quran is the word of God. See, it's the same. This completely shuts them up. They accuse you of being uh, hating Muhammad, which is the exact opposite. They hate Muhammad. And the Quran says that only the, the hypocrites say Muhammad Rasulullah. They add it to that. You put God, Muhammad's name next to God's name. You can take this to a further and say, uh, why not say La ilaha illallah, the sun rises from the east. You know, there's no end to this. Why don't you believe the sun rises from the east? So there are millions of statements that we can put next to La ilaha illallah that are absolutely correct. But this is not the point. Verse 18 of Surah 3 says, God bears witness that La ilaha illallah. I lost my notes. When they 
very thank you all. You follow Rashad Khalifa. If they're polite, with the crazy Rashad Khalifa, if they're normal, <laughs> you tell them we follow God. We follow God alone. We follow the word of God alone. The principle is very easy. If it is not in the Quran, we don't. We have no consideration for it. In this conference, you're going to hear lots of views, personal views of many people. Anybody can say anything they want. But your criterion is the Quran. If it is not in the Quran, don't believe it. No matter who is talking to you. It's a very simple principle. So this is what we follow. Even in this conference, Satan has to be represented, especially in this conference. Satan has to be represented, and you're going to hear some views and that are contrary to the Quran. And if you believe them, you deserve to believe them. There may be two or three people who will, who will be influenced. Because the purpose of these people who are bringing views other than the Quranic views is to at least put doubt in your heart. And if you, as long as you have doubt in your heart, you're in the lowest rank of, of submission. You remember the verse in Surah 49, verse 11, I believe. It says, Khalif uh, al-Arabu uh, they said, we are believers. And God says, do not say you're believers, say you are uh, Muslims. Until all doubt is gone. So their job is to put even a little bit of doubt in your heart. And when this happens, you know that God is testing you and that, unfortunately, if the doubt comes in my heart, but unfortunately I still have some doubts. So I'm still in the lowest track. I'm still on my way. It's not hopeless yet. <coughs> But you must be aware of this principle. This is our principle. If it is not in the Quran, I don't believe. It may or may not be correct. But if it is not in the Quran, I'm not following it. We have time now to do the Friday prayer and then we go into, I can't think of any longer <laughs> until it's made it here, so we'll just go through with the Friday prayer, and uh, I'm sure Ismail will get this chance to express his views, he had, he had prepared a very good photo on the ink and paper, but uh, this, this, is, this is not the Quran, the ink and paper, the physical book is not the Quran, the Quran is in your heart, and when the Prophet Muhammad was taken to the seventh heaven to see the Quran, God does not give him a book. Is my here? No. I waited and I waited. And I oh, you were supposed to, you were supposed to come with you. Yes. And I went. His flight was in. The flight from Los Angeles was here. And he was now. Okay. How about the uh, Washington The group? Washington, I have uh, Apple Bar here. Okay. But Apple Bar here has shot the devil that way. Wakili, Valencia? No, Wakili, no, I didn't see. Uh, I mean? They were supposed to be, basically the flag was supposed to be at the same time. Okay. I'm glad you brought Dr. Tabat Tabari here, yes. with honor. And uh, where is Abdul Wahid? Yeah. Brother Abdul Wahid, that you? <coughs> Welcome to the conference. So it looks like Ismail, uh, we do believe that we'll be there for his own funeral. <laughs> <laughs> and now it is confirmed. Not <laughs> 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 